My name's Carmen Baskoff, and I'm a producer for Where We Live. My time at WNPR has been a happy one, mostly. But months ago, I began urging Colin McEnroe and producer Jonathan McNichol to devote some time on their Friday cultural roundtable, The Nose, to the television show The Good Place. It's a comedy set in the afterlife. So you know those situations where people seem like they're listening to you, but they also seem like they're never going to act on your suggestion? Well, that's how they acted. The Good Place contains some very profound messages about how good and bad can exist in the same person. So I brought out my bad side. And now they're doing the show. Because they're afraid. I hope you enjoy it. You're welcome. So uh, welcome to this uh, unusual episode, uh, an episode which has an unusual genesis, as you might have heard in some commentary that ran before the news. But if you didn't hear that, what happened was that uh, Where We Live's producer, one of the Where We Live producers, Carmen Baskoff, quite some time ago, I'm not exactly sure how long ago, first approached us and said, you know, you really ought to talk on your nose, the Friday cultural roundtable, the nose, you ought to devote a segment to The Good Place. And uh, neither I nor Jonathan McPants, the producer of said show, had ever seen The Good Place. And we kind of did that thing. You know, it really is true. Yeah, OK. Yeah. OK. <laughs> and and that didn't actually work somehow. It's just such an incredibly good technique most of the time. And Carmen just sort of kept coming back. And although Carmen is – you know, I think uh, um, ordinarily kind of an introvert. She might even be the biggest introvert on our staff and that's really saying something because there's just almost wall-to-wall introverts. She, it turns out she has a very forceful side that can even start to sound a little bit menacing, maybe because she's ordinarily you know, so reticent. So uh, at a certain point, this tone crept into her voice after we'd blown off this idea like six times. <laughs> and, and, and thank God because – or thank somebody anyway because uh, The Good Place is an amazing show which, you know, once we started binging it and we, we understood exactly why she wanted us to do this. And so that's what we're doing today. The whole show, in fact, is going to be about The Good Place uh, in studio is uh, – are, in fact, two voices very familiar to listeners of this station. Susan Bigelow, librarian, columnist for CT News Junkie and a science fiction fantasy novelist, Rebecca Castellani, director of venue operations and tour marketing for We Save Music. Um, Also joining us uh, by Skype right now is Sam Anderson, uh, a staff writer for The New York Times Magazine. His piece about The Good Place in last year's culture issue is called The Ultimate Sitcom. Uh, And uh, we should also say that uh, Sam's recent book, Boomtown, the fantastical saga, saga of Oklahoma City, its chaotic founding, its purloined basketball team, and the dream of becoming a world class metropolis has essentially nothing to do with the conversation that we're going to have. But then, you know, it's it is there. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I, I think first of all, for those of you who are coming in cold on this, um, maybe the best thing to do is to to begin at the beginning and say that uh, um, season one of The Good Place, it's now finishing up season three, has finished season three, uh, found a almost sociopathically corrosive personality (laughs) named Eleanor uh, waking up in the afterlife uh, and meeting the presiding something or other of the afterlife, Uh, someone named Michael played by uh, Ted Danson. Eleanor is played by Kristen Bell. Let's just hear a little bit of how that went. So you, Eleanor Shellstrop, are dead. Your life on Earth has ended and you are now in the next phase of your existence in the universe. Cool. Cool. I have some questions. Thought you might. Um, so who was right? I mean, about all of this? Every religion guessed about 5%, except for Doug Forsett. Wh- who's Doug Forsett? Uh, well, Doug was a stoner kid who lived in Calgary during the 1970s. One night he got really high on mushrooms and his best friend Randy said, Hey, what do you think happens after we die? And... Doug just launched into this long monologue where he got like 92% correct. I mean, 
We couldn't believe what we were hearing. That's him, actually, right up there. He's pretty famous around here. So, <laughs> maybe my biggest question. Am I... I mean, is this... Well, it's not the heaven or hell idea that you were raised on. But generally speaking, in the afterlife, there's a good place and there's a bad place. You're in the good place. You're okay, Eleanor. You're in the good place. All right. So, uh, Sam, I'm going to start with you and just say uh, when you pitched this idea to the New York Times magazine, um, what was your pitch? Why did you think uh, it deserved a pride of place? Um, because the show blew me away. I mean, my story was kind of like yours. I had not heard of it. Um, and I think it was deep in the second season and I heard about it on a podcast. Um, and it sounded right up my alley. And so I started watching it and soon I roped my wife in and, and we watched the whole first season. And then we roped our kids in who were 14 and 11 and we all binged the first season again and then the second season. It was just like nothing I've ever seen on television. And to me, it was like, I mean, it's just one of those kind of magical, like near perfect works of popular art, I think. And it hit on so many levels that television shows and especially sitcoms don't really get to. Um, so I was just I was just excited by this thing as a work of art. And I wanted to try to articulate what was so great about it? And really, as just like a fan, I wanted to go out and hang out on set and see how it got put together. So I got to do that for a couple of days. The, uh, there's something about the adoption curve of this series that's a little bit different from um, other really hyper popular series. In a way, it kind of reminds me of Hamilton in the sense that you know, if you say no, it's a musical about Alexander Hamilton, you know, and it's mainly you know in hip hop and stuff like that, I'm, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. And there's actually kind of a Hamilton joke uh, in the Good Place, but if you try to describe the Good Place to somebody, it doesn't necessarily sound great. And that may be why it takes people some time to get to it. I think both of our in studio uh, people have had kind of the same same experience. In fact, Rebecca, you sort of started, faltered and started back up. Yeah. Uh, in my household, I am the dark TV watcher and my partner is the light TV watcher. You like the murdery shows. I the think more you... murdery, the better. And so <laughs> I don't really go in for sitcoms typically. And my boyfriend was watching it. I believe he watched the first episode right when it came out. And I really didn't respond very well to it. I was sort of half watching, not really. I thought, yeah, there's some funny jokes in here. I really love Ted Danson. I love uh, Kristen Bell, but it just didn't grab me. And it did grab Stephen and he continued to watch it. And as the weeks went on, I caught myself really starting to pay attention to it, especially the um, – she's not a human or a robot. She's more like a walking Siri mm-hmm. named Janet. And Janet really got me. She's, a, she's this like infinite database of knowledge that can supply anyone in the good place with any answers they're looking for. And she's played by Darcy Carden who just does some of the most incredible – and I believe a lot of it is improvisational work on the show – and I just started to fall in love with it. So I started back at the beginning and went all the way through the first season and have been a loyal viewer ever since. Yeah. What about you, Susan? So my wife and I, we had finished our marathon years-long watching of all of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were looking for something new to watch. And everybody had been talking about this show. I was like, oh, OK. Uh, we'll give it a try. The premise sounded kind of, it did, sounded kind of flimsy. I wasn't really – you know, the idea of, oh, someone's in the afterlife and this whole premise. Um, it just sounded kind of weird. So I thought this is the kind of thing where I'm going to watch a couple of episodes and give up on it. But as soon as we started watching it, we were hooked like immediately. And this was only about like six months ago. So we immediately just started binging the entire thing. This is such a binge-worthy show. It's really – it's it's almost as if it's been created to be, to be binged. binged. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, I find it actually surprising sometimes that, it, oh, this is actually on the air and it airs I have weekly. to wait a week? Yeah, yeah what's <laughs> up with that? Uh, but no, because it, it every episode ends on this sort of, sort of cliffhanger, it draws you right through into the next one. You have to watch the next one. Oh, no, you have to keep going. Uh, so, yes, we just inhaled the series um, and – it's just I'm a, a little obsessed with it now. I have to admit. Yeah, I, it's easily obsessible. So Sam, it's funny that you mentioned Star Trek. Not only because Janet is sort of a dateable data, mm. um, yes, but um, uh, yeah, Janet just is quite a bit more physically appealing, appealing than Data ever was on his best day. But um, but I think also, Sam, this is an ensemble series. It, it really has uh, this tremendous, mainly six-person ensemble. Uh, you know, and and I think ensemble series have 
in some ways lost a little bit uh, of their popularity or they aren't quite what they used to be. Uh, uh, but I would argue that this is perfectly balanced. You know, you've got Kristen Bell playing this you know, mostly unrepentant chronic sociopath. You've got an indecisive philosophy nerd drowning in scholarship, a name-dropping, humble-bragging, supermodel, super-rich giantess, a shrimpy, dopey swamp, city gamer with tremendous joie de vivre. You've got Janet. We already <laughs> talked about her. And, and then the extraordinarily complex eternal being who is ultimately neurosis ridden and is always in just the right amount in addition to being Michael. One of the things I love about this performance is he's never not Ted Danson. There's sort of a way in which he's always a little bit Ted Danson but just enough. But you know, Sam, I don't know what the vibe was on the set. Well, I do a little bit from reading your article. But it's, this seems like a really perfect kind of ensemble. It really is. And when I was trying to think about the different performances, like I was thinking about Jamila Jamil, who plays Tahani and who is just a joy to be around in person. Um, and I was telling someone about it, I was kind of like, well, she really, she's the standout performance. She really steals the show. And then I think, oh, wait a second. No, there's Janet, Darcy Carden. She kind of steals the show. And actually, Ted Danson, really. I mean, and you can go through the entire list of mm-hmm. actors and characters here, and everyone. Um, is unique and irreplaceable and kind of pops out of the landscape of the show. I mean, and on set, it, it's just a love fest. I mean, um, you know, I went in kind of uh, a little skeptical of that because you hear that from a lot of different creative teams working together. But I think this is a special case because the creator of the show, Mike Schur, is famous in the industry for um, this policy of hiring, which is. Uh, I mean, the the cleaned up version is no jerks. He vets people to make sure that there just aren't any toxic personalities around, no matter how talented anyone is, um, from the leading star to the the people who are doing the tech side of things. Um, That's the main requirement is that you are a good person, you're a nice person, and you're good to work with. I mean, this show came like deep from his soul. He wanted to investigate what it meant to be a good person in the world and the challenges and complexities of that. And so he put together this team comprised of insofar as he could, he could vet such a thing, really good people. And they all uh, seem to really deeply love each other and be striving to make this work of art that is like actually investigating that question in a meaningful philosophical way. You know, I should point out that Michael Schur, the aforementioned creator of the series, grew up a roughly eight-minute drive from where we're sitting right now. Um, wow. And uh, and there apparently is some uh, inspiration for some of his uh, series. I, I'm not sure about this one, but he also was co-founder of Parks and Rec and he apparently based – I think he based Pawnee on Simsbury or something. I can't oh, remember really? the whole thing. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about this ensemble idea too, uh, Rebecca, too, because I, one of the things that I always felt – I grew up with some series where the ensembles were really interestingly balanced. You know, I always point to Taxi where Judd Hirsch is kind of the moral center of the everyman and then you've got Danny DeVito as this completely corrupt and horrible uh, little man and then you've got Christopher Lloyd as this guy who's in touch with an alternative reality and you've got Tony Danza as this sort of dopey boxer and, and there are all these different worldviews that, 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 that support each other and, and provide alternatives to each other and I feel like in the Seinfeld era, we started to get ensembles where they all kind of had the same approach to life. I would put Veep in that category. But one of the things I love about this series is that everybody – each one of these cast members, first of all, perfectly plays the character that they're supposed to be playing. And each one of these characters offers a slightly different take on things. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the Seinfeld comparison is a great one. I I never could connect with Seinfeld. I – Certain jokes I thought were funny, but I struggled with Seinfeld because I just felt like I was getting, you know, the same viewpoint told through slightly different variations of acting. And this show is so refreshing, not only in its commitment to having a diverse cast, but the fact that they're really debating. You, and you get almost a sense that the actors themselves are debating these moral, ethical, philosophical questions with each other. To the, I mean, I, I've been listening to The Good Place, this podcast, which is fabulous. Any fan of the show should really check it out. It's really great. And Mike Schur was talking about how he makes these packets with all the dense philosophy and will give them to the actors and they'll read them. And that becomes – that informs their performances to this very intimate level. And I, I think that the fact that they're all kind of attending to it with their own humanity in addition to the acting that they've been given is just fabulous. It's, it's really a wonderful, unique 
setting for a sitcom. Susan, I think another thing the series does in a really interesting way is blend high and low humor. Now, the high humor couldn't get higher. I mean, it's theological in nature. It's philosophical in, in nature. There's a tremendous reliance on, on everybody's liberal arts uh, education uh, so that you know that the book being slid across the table is by Martin Heidegger or something. But there's also <laughs> – because all of these people are reprobates, there's a lot of really funny – you know, sex jokes and body type jokes and dumb guy jokes oh, and yeah. regional jokes that are absolutely kind of as about as low as they get. The the Jacksonville running Jacksonville gags are oh. some of some of my favorite. Um, <laughs> so good. <laughs> having been to Jacksonville, mm. yeah, um, I, I, it, it does amuse me that that Blake Bortles is a real <laughs> person yeah. um, on, on, on a real NFL team. Um, well, we should say that just very quickly. There is a little – this uh, character, Jason, makes a little joke about the fact that he has to run off uh, and on some escape plan and he wants to save the Madden game he's playing because Blake Bortles <laughs> has just yes. thrown for 300 yards. And, you know, Blake Bortles is like the funniest – quarterback joke you could make in that situation. There's, so there's people who work on the show who know about Derek Parfit's philosophy and also know that Blake Bortles <laughs> yes. is a very funny football player. And it's a funny name anyway. Yeah. No, yeah, there's, right. there's a lot of very low humor and it's, it's almost like that's the candy coating for all the high, high class philosophy jokes. So it really does it – gets, it gets me on every single level and I love that. It's not elitist. You never get the sense that no. it's talking down to you even no, no. though the subject matter oftentimes is you know, difficult, advanced level of philosophy. It's, it's brilliant. Um, Sam, you know, Seinfeld famously – or the Seinfeld ethos was famously no hugs, no learning. Well, you, you know, Michael Schur has explicitly <laughs> turned this on its head, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, that was that was one thing I kind of realized as I was watching the show and trying to figure out what was so what felt so new about it. And what I landed on was there's always been this tension running through the history of the sitcom as a form, which is this tension between just giving us kind of a fire hose of jokes uh, and making us laugh and entertaining us versus this impulse to kind of teach us something about life. Um, I call it in the piece I wrote, I called it the, the jester impulse versus the guru impulse. And so, you know, in the eighties, you remember a lot of those sitcoms, you had kind of a lot of very special episodes. Uh, you were supposed to come away with some, some, um, deep appreciation for like telling the truth and, uh, not doing drugs. And, um, that after a while gets very tedious, of course. And Seinfeld kind of swung the pendulum all the way to the other direction and said, we're not interested in learning. We're not in interested in goodness um, and virtue. We are just going to make you laugh. We're going to be as cynical as possible. Um, and it was, you know, they called themselves the show about nothing. My wife had a great line. She said, if Seinfeld was the show about nothing, the good place is the show about everything. Mm -hmm. Because the good place takes that tension at the heart of the sitcom and it makes the entire show about that. This is a show that is explicitly about learning. And we should say maybe just to set it up like Eleanor, who is this, as she calls herself, Arizona trash bag. Um, <laughs> and just like kind of the worst person you've ever seen, um, is wrongly placed in the good place she discovers and so she asks her soulmate that she's paired with in The Good Place, Chidi, who's an ethics professor, to teach her how to be a good person. And so you have very explicitly that impulse of the sitcom where someone's learning a lesson just right at the center of everything. So every joke in The Good Place is a joke essentially about being a good person, about, about virtue, about learning. So it's kind of an amazing, amazingly daring kind of parlor trick. We should say one more thing uh, without which you will not understand other things that get said here, which is that one of the conventions of the show is that in the afterlife, well, Eleanor in particular, the Arizona trash bag, has a real potty mouth. The problem is in the afterlife, everything that you say, uh, if in fact it is a, a vulgarity or a profanity, uh, is automatically adjusted. So it comes out of your mouth in a completely different way. Uh, here's kind of a little s sense of how that sounds. Somebody royally forked up. <laughs> Somebody forked up. Why can't I say fork? If you're trying to curse, you can't hear. I guess a lot of people in this neighborhood don't like it, so it's prohibited. That's bullshit. What the fork? Who are you? To a home. You're a condescending bench. Okay. All right? Okay. Things only started getting crazy after I was an asshole to everyone at the party. Ugh! You know I'm trying to say asshole and not ash hole, right? I got that, yes. Okay. Yeah. 
We're fourth here, aren't we? That Tahani is a real butthead, huh? <gasps> hey! At least I can still say butthead. Oh, she is a butthead. Oh, fork me. So um, uh, hmm. just we're going to take a break here in just a second here. But I, 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 I've already gotten a sense uh, from Sam that, uh, that Tahani has – uh, seduced him in any number of ways uh, and, and had become kind of maybe a favorite of his. De- uh, but there's a way also, as Sam also said, everybody's your favorite character because the ensemble works so well. I don't know. Susan and Rebecca. Susan, are you particularly enamored of any particular character? Oh, I couldn't do without Janet. Yeah. Uh, I do love Janet. I, I also really – surprisingly, I, I love Jason. Mm-hmm. Oh, I do. Uh, I, he's just so – he's so pure in his way of uh, – yeah, it's, it's well in, in that in that sort of ensemble balance. There's an awful lot of uh, cynical characters uh, and self-seeking characters. Uh, Jason is the one who, as I said before, has an incredible joie de vivre, which I think f- helps feed the balance of the ensemble. And you're a Rebecca, uh, you're a no, you're a Janet person, Rebecca. Yes, or very a Rebecca much. person, Janet. I mean, that's a very high compliment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm definitely <laughs> Janet is steals the sea. Every scene she's in just runs away with it for me. But I do agree with everything we've been saying about the ensemble cast. I've never related across. Across the board, to, and enjoyed so many characters. Just there's really not a weak spot on the cast. I can't think of anybody that I would say even the ben- level beneath ensemble. The, the recurring characters that appear maybe once a season are fantastic. The I don't want to give anything away, but there's just so many wonderful, wonderful characters. All right, so uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to add a character to our ensemble, uh, and we're going to keep talking about the good place. Excellent progress this week. Tahani devastated by party mishap. Eleanor continues to be a selfish monster creating burden for Chidi. Selfish monster? I brought you back from the brink of an existential coma, dude. No, no. I have to embellish on these fake reports so that my boss doesn't get suspicious. But really, I am grateful you pulled me out of my funk. Well, now that you've become acquainted with existential crises, I thought we could read Death. By philosopher Todd May. Sounds like the perfect beach read. <laughs> All right. So a uh, philosopher getting name checked uh, on The Good Place. I'm Peter Singer is probably on the phone to his agent saying, how do I get this? <laughs> um, so uh, in studio with us uh, talking about The Good Place, our two regular panelists of The News, uh, Rebecca Castellani and Susan Bigelow, who's now a regular panelist on both The News and The Wheelhouse, uh, which is like you know being on the Celtics and the Red Sox. Uh, and uh, Sam Anderson, staff writer for The New York Times, uh, did a piece about The Good uh, Place in last year's culture issue. It's called The Ultimate Sitcom. Now joining us is aforementioned name-checked philosopher, uh, Todd May, a philosophical advisor on The Good Place. His most recent book is A Fragile Life, Accepting Our Vulnerability. Uh, Todd May, welcome to the conversation. It's good to be here. So um, maybe just begin by telling us uh, how did you become affiliated with this show? Well, it, actually, it was quite by accident. Uh, one of the writers, Dan Schofield, uh, had read uh, my little book on death, uh, recommended it to Mike Schur. Uh, Mike read it. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, it caused tension in his marriage because his wife found him reading it at night. It's a, it's a little book with a dark gray and a raven on the color. Uh, uh, so it's not the kind of book that you generally bring to bed. And in any event, uh, apparently the marriage outlasted my book. So <laughs> later he called me up or he emailed me and said, are, are you interested in talking about this a little bit? Uh, we Skyped for a couple of hours and then the one thing led to another. Uh, Skypings, uh, meetings with uh, the writers uh, and then uh, num- uh, several videos. Maybe you can say a little bit more about – I mean it, 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 we've tried to convey the, the role that academic philosophy, that moral philosophy plays on this show. And it, it is both steeped in it in terms of plot and but also layered on mm. in a very direct way. And I mean I do – I think it's in the first season and maybe one of the first couple of episodes – this character, Chidi, who is a professor of moral philosophy or was until he died, uh, is doing a little dry erase board lecture. And you can sort of see kind of through his armpit uh, the last name of Derek Parfit. Well, mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of, you know, that's going a little bit up the bookshelf. That's not Aristotle or a name that everybody <laughs> would know. <laughs> it's sort of a signal that, no, they're going to they're gonna go deep on this, right? Right. Well, and I think one of the things is that they have issues that they want to discuss, things that they are thinking about. Stemming from what you talked about earlier in the show, which is Mike's attempt to want to think about being good. 
So the issues lead them to the philosophers, and the philosophers, are the, whoever it is, that is going to be able to respond to that issue. And Derek Parfit writes a lot about identity, about what it is to continue to be a self. And, and when you think about the show this way, th- these are people who are selves who have died, who are now in another dimension, who come back uh, into the secular world as selves. So how are they going to think about their identity? And that's an issue that really comes up in the third season, which will lead them to a philosopher like Parfit. Um, I want to ask the in-studio panelists, particularly uh, maybe Susan, you in particular, because you really have been binging, and I've been binging a bit too. Do you find that the kind of frame of this show kind of creeps into your real-life decisions? I'm finding, you know, because oh I've, I've, yes. yeah, I've, I've done nothing but watch this show in my spare time, and now everything, I'm looking at everything through that lens all of a sudden. Seriously, no, I've... I've I suddenly find like the, the philosophy of the shows and what does this mean to be a good person in this case? And, and if I do this, is that it has all these unintended consequences. And um, sometimes I find myself in a cheaty like panic where I can't make a decision. So thanks. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I actually do because I like to think about this stuff. This is interesting stuff to me, the thinking about what makes a good person, what makes a moral person, especially, especially today. Um, I find myself thinking about the show and its connection to everything else that's going on in the world. Um, how do you be a good person in, this, in such a complicated world? How do you be a good person when everybody around you seems like they don't care anymore? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's good that way. It gets me to think about this stuff. It's really, really useful. Yeah, Rebecca, how about you? Is, is there kind of an afterburn going on? No, I no. absolutely think even when a season ends and I'm left with this gulf in between seasons, I find that I'm thinking about the show a lot. Usually a show ends and I'm done with it and that's that and close the book and I don't think about it until it restarts again. But this definitely carries over with me. I think it's important to note that the way they determine whether you get into the good place or the bad place is based on a point system. So I definitely find myself thinking, like, do I really want to listen to the Red Hot Chili Peppers right now? I could lose some <laughs> points. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I, w- I was wondering, to, I wanted to ask both Sam, uh, well, for, uh, we'll start with Sam. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much of this uh, Michael Schur was sharing with you, but it seems to me that, yeah, obviously there's kind of a kind of an adult learning course going on in this show for both the characters and us watching it. But it seems to me also that there are some things that are going on on a much more plot and character driven level that are also, uh, in an unspoken way, explorations uh, of philosophical and I would say theological questions too. Uh, I don't know if, if what I'm saying is resonating with you at all, Sam. Um, well, I think what you're saying is, yeah, we have these explicit references throughout the show, um, often in the form of jokes, but often in the form of little explainers of, of the works of famous philosophers and, and not so famous philosophers. But you also have on a much deeper level, um, Right, these idea, those ideas woven into the fabric of the show in ways that, you know, let's say Chidi was – there was no character of Chidi who's teaching another character moral philosophy. It would still be a show if it had these plot elements that was deeply about moral philosophy. Um, so they're really they're, – they're referencing them explicitly, but they're also really trying to explore through storytelling – um, the borders of these issues of what it means to good, be a good person, what it means to depend on other people. Um, you know, is it is it the same thing to be a good person as to want to be a good person? Uh, are those things in conflict with one another? You see these played out in the choices that the characters make. Um, and I think as the show progresses, um, you get this really beautiful lesson in interdependence. Um, one of the other academic philosophical books that comes up quite a lot is um, a book by a philosopher named T.M. Scanlon called What We Owe to Each Other. Um, and that's really an idea that a lot of the action in the show orbits around is what what do we owe to each other? Um, and the characters, as they become better people, um, start to orient themselves more around the obligations that they have to other people rather than just their own particular fate and point totals. You know, Todd, I have so many questions about all this, but maybe I'll start with one. You know, when it seems like every time I read an article uh, about this or listen to a conversation like this one, um, I hear the word philosoph- philosophy or philosophical. 
less so than theology or theological. And But I mean a quick survey of the internet tells me that there are churches all over America who are doing special The Good Place programs. You know, they're, they're using the series as a teaching model. Um, and I, I don't know how you process that. I, I actually do – well, I'll just let you sort of take that. Let, I'll let you react to it. Well, I think one of the things that Mike wanted to do with the show was not make it oriented toward any particular religion uh, mm-hmm. or against religion. So he creates a good place, and and, and you had this in, in part one of the snippets of the show, uh, in which everything gets it part or every religion gets it partially right. So this is something that can be open to religion, but doesn't proselytize in one way or another, and doesn't, by the way, proselytize philosophically either. Uh, so what it does is it sets things up so that you can be religious or not religious and the show can still speak to you. Uh, and I also let me pick up also on something Sam just said because one of the important philosophical elements of the show doesn't occur when they're talking about philosophy. Mm. Uh, it occurs in the relationships themselves. Yes. It's as though in the context of forming bonds with people, Eleanor with Chidi, uh, Michael with the four of them, that the that the the moral character begins to emerge for uh, for them, that they're treating each other well. So it's not as though they're reading a bunch of philosophy and then learning how to treat each other. It's that they're ve- developing relationships out of which their own uh, we could say their own moral character gets to come to the fore. Right, hell is other people, but heaven is also other people. Exactly, um, mm-hmm. and, and um, so yeah, I want to talk. I think we can do this without any spoilers. We should say that more than a typical sitcom, I would say this is also a very plot-driven show. A lot is done. I mean, season two is very different from season one in its configuration, and and so on. And we're being very very careful so that if you just start at season one, episode one, we're not going to blow anything too badly for you. I, I don't think. I think mm. we can talk about this without screwing it up. So. Um, I think one of the really interesting questions here that's not being discussed academically, and I'll, I, I'd love to hear everybody about this, but Rebecca, I'll, I'll start talking to you, is this character of Eleanor, Eleanor the protagonist played by Kristen Bell, uh, is, as we've been saying all along, has been – kind of a sociopath, a near sociopath uh, in life, uh, somebody who has taken basically every unbelievably selfish choice with absolutely zero regard for the consequences of those choices for other people. Um, And yet somehow or other, there is a sense that runs through this series. And I I have to also say, I'm not on season three yet. I've been binging and I haven't quite caught up. So I don't know what what changes. But I have a sense that she – that moral progress can only be made – by or at least with the help of Eleanor, that Eleanor somehow or other is the key. Uh, And that's a very theologically interesting question. Yeah, I think if you look at where the characters all start off, objectively, Eleanor is the worst. I mean, she is just unapologetically not a good person. And the fact that she becomes the linchpin that keeps this group together and keeps them on track beyond Chidi's lessons, you know, she's really the impetus outside of the classroom to get them all thinking about this stuff and keeping them together I think that's a very interesting character development because she doesn't ever fully divorce herself from some of her more odious tendencies. She, you know, she's not, it's not like she suddenly starts taking moral philosophy classes and is perfect. She really struggles with a lot of this stuff, but in her struggle, it allows the other characters to kind of get in touch with the parts of them that aren't maybe not so moral. And I I think it's definitely very smart to position Eleanor as that that linchpin for the rest of them. Yeah, there's some sense, Susan, that morality is something other than perfection. That's true. Um, that mor- per- perfection seems like it's completely unattainable, mm. um, but morality is is all contained in your actions and your relationships with other people. Uh, and I, I love how that sort of grows throughout uh, the first season, and then again in the second season, and and going on and on. Um, how these people cannot get any better without each other. They need each other. They need these relationships in order to. Uh, become more moral and more sort of fulfilled and happier people in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, morality uh, and right and wrong are just not just these sort of clear-cut right and wrong things. It's it's very much tied into every little action and every little relationship we may have. It's like the difference between reading a 
you know, Martin Heidegger being in time on your own and then being in a classroom with a bunch of other learners that are asking questions. I mean, it definitely mm. requires others to make sense of a lot of this stuff. Right. And so Todd May, this also, I mean, she just provided a very nice segue, which is we should first of all say if you really want to do a deeper dive, there's always Mother Forkin Morals <laughs> with Dr. Todd May. <laughs> which is oh, great. Which, yeah, which is, you Thank can you. watch uh, on YouTube and other places, I think. But um, and you know, for for anybody coming out of the academic tradition, Todd, th- this is going to be kind of thrilling. I mean, the trolley problem might be the moral <laughs> philosophy problem that everybody knows, but you know, until a certain character snaps his fingers and actually gets the trolley rolling, we've never <laughs> seen it before. Right. Actually, and I want to talk, say something about the trolley problem in, specifically. Uh, but but actually, let me say. First, that I don't commend anybody to read Martin Heidegger on their own. Uh, I just want that was to, an extreme example. I just want to establish that point before we move on. Don't do it. Um, but the trolley problem is interesting because in philosophy, it tends to be talked about as though it were a, uh, an abstract issue. Uh, and what's great about the show is by placing Chidi in it, he, now all of the emotional components come out that often get lost in philosophy. And I asked Chidi during one of the podcasts whether being in the trolley made the problem feel different for him, right? And he said, aside the fact that they were shooting carob syrup into his mouth, <laughs> right, but that, that in fact it did feel different. Uh, and one of the things that sometimes gets lost in academic philosophy is the emotional component because people go ab- get abstract and in their head. And the show brings that out without... You know, forcing it. I was going to say forcing it down your throat <laughs> would be a terrible thing, given what I just said. Yeah, I, I see him. I, once again, I keep coming back to that idea that really, in, in all the ways that everybody else is talking about right now, this show connects, you know, pretty abstract concepts to real humanity, uh, which is what great teachers do, too. I mean, I think about, you know, books like Cicilla Box books on lying and secrets. You know, you can read those books and absolutely understand your world better. There's nothing abstract uh, about it or very little that's abstract. I, I don't know w- what your your visits to the set or your conversations with the performers have told you about that. Yeah, um... I keep I keep going back to this idea. One of the things I came away from, um, we were talking earlier about the nature of morality and it being not an issue of – it's not an on-off switch. Um, and it's not about becoming a perfect person. Um, and I think the most powerful idea that I left with is very simple. And I write about this at the end of my piece. But it, the third season really pivots around this idea. And it's simply the notion of trying mm. – and it's just that word, which is so powerful to me right now, and Mike Schur talked a lot about, um, that in this kind of endless firestorm of conflict and scandal and compromise and distraction, uh, in the face of your own failures and the failures of the people around you, um, the really heroic thing on a moment-to-moment, day-to-day level is just trying you just try your best, and it's so hard to do. Um, and that's something I saw on set. It was kind of it was fascinating watching them put this show together because I don't know if any of you have ever been on a sitcom set. It is an alien world. I mean, it's just a different. I, I had watched the show and loved the show, and I walked onto the set and saw these <laughs> human beings performing the roles that I had just been watching on these on this flat screen. And I was like, what are they doing? Why are they acting like this? Because in, in a three-dimensional space, human to human, it looks so weird. And they're surrounded by these huge, in, this sort of industrial architecture of equipment. And they move it three centimeters, and then they do the lines again. And, and watching them in person, they don't seem like they're acting like real humans at all. It's bizarre, and it's hard. It's just so tedious. But they just keep grinding through it. And um, they just keep trying. And it was kind of inspiring to see how hard everybody was working to put this show together, how much work it takes to create 10 seconds of a television show. Um, and that, I think, really was was the deeper theme that Mike Schur wanted people to come away with, especially at the end of season three, was like, it doesn't stop. You don't solve the problem and then you're good. You try and you grind and you and you get through the slog moment by moment every single day. I found that really inspiring. Um, I want to talk about one more thing that kind of surfaces in in season two, I think. Uh, and uh, Todd, uh, that is yeah. this notion of this still small voice, to use the Latter Day Saints term. But uh, let's hear uh, how Eleanor talks about it. This would be B two. 
You never once stop trying to become a better person. And I just... Why? I don't know. I mean, whenever I would do something crappy on Earth, there would be a little tiny voice in the back of my head that would say, Eleanor, don't grab that handful of olives from the salad bar. You know, you didn't pay for that. Or, Eleanor, don't spit those olive pits onto the floor of the grocery store. That's not cool. Or, Eleanor, that old man just slipped on your olive pit and he fell down. Don't use the fact that everyone's distracted to go back and steal more olives. Again. This ethics stuff, it's hard. And it's confusing. It is such a buzzkill. But it does get rid of the little voice. Because at least I'm trying to do the right thing instead of the crappy thing. And, and I gotta say, man... I don't miss the little voice. So, uh, Todd, we're back to Sam's idea of trying uh, Mm -hmm. and that notion that maybe we do have some kind of built-in moral capacity. Maybe you could say what what you see Michael Schur doing with this. This is actually a fascinating moment in the show because a lot of the show does try to take up philosophical positions and views that are already there. This is a case where Mike's starting to put his own cards on the table. Uh, he, he said he believes that we do have a voice of conscience that, that sometimes orients it, us and that we listen to it at times and that we don't listen to it at times. And one of the issues that, that, that comes up if you're thinking about this is where does the voice come from? Is it built in? Uh, is it the case, of, well, there's an ancient philosopher, Mencius, who thinks it's a built-in voice. There are other philosophers who think, no, 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 it's not that it's built in. It's that we have sympathy for people around us, and then that gets extended to people we don't know. There are other philosophers who think that, in fact, what it is, is that we're just born socially, and all of the morality and the voice of conscience gets created as we go along. Uh, what Mike has done is he hasn't taken a position on any of that, but he says, however it has occurred, we have a voice that begins to orient us if we listen to it, or to come back to, uh, to Sam's point, if we just keep trying to listen to it. All right. We're going to uh, pause there. Uh, we're talking about The Good Place. Uh, season three has just ended. You've got plenty of time to catch up. Uh, I don't think – I think we've done a good job talking about a lot of aspects of this show. I don't think we've successfully conveyed how forking funny this show is. I mean it's really, really funny, like laugh out loud funny every episode. So if that got lost in all of our high-flown uh, contemplations, I don't want it to. Son of a bench! This forking show is produced by Jonathan McPants and me, Kion Wolf, based on a concept by Carmen Baskoff. The concept was that if we didn't do this episode, Carmen was going to hurt us in some strange and unpredictable way. The part of Bill Curry was played by Adam Scott. We'll be back on Monday with a show about the weekend news. Although my guess is that booking Roger Stone as a guest has become less likely. And now, back to the okay place. Okay, so um, we should say also that uh, there are, if you're a student of Parks and Rec, uh, there apparently are zillions of Parks and Rec Easter eggs scattered yes. all the way through I can a confirm. good place. Yeah, so for example, one of the characters does die by suffocation in a safe, and the safe is made by the Swanson Safe Company. There's stuff like that. Um, so uh, we're going to make some recommendations and endorsements. Uh, why don't we begin? Let's begin with one of the seasoned hands here. So uh, Rebecca, go ahead. So I have a couple documentaries for you this week. Um, the first is the literal embodiment of the bad place if you are a rich millennial, and that is the fire documentary on Netflix, The Greatest Party That Never Happened. I was aware of this story when it came out, as I'm sure most of us were. This documentary is something else. You, uh, you will laugh and you will cry and you will feel all sorts of strange feelings. So I highly recommend it. I don't necessarily think it's a good thing, but it's, it's worth watching. And the second one, which just blew my mind, I was on the edge of my seat for, was Three Identical Strangers, which is on Amazon. And I believe it's airing next week on uh, primetime. So highly recommend both of those, Three Identical Strangers and Fire, the greatest party that never happened. Yeah, we did. We devoted an episode of The Nose to the latter one when it came out in um, theatrical release. And there's a lot of talk about maybe doing uh, the fire one uh, on The Nose. So uh, uh, Todd, why don't you go next? Uh, do you have a recommendation for us? I, I do. But now, I, let me say this to start, though. When a philosopher makes a recommendation about <laughs> stuff in popular culture, this I just... Is- 
I hope I'm not just met with howls of derision. You're, you're, you're kind of pulling a cheaty already. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want yeah. to say that. No, but I could decide. I could decide what I wanted to say. So I want to recommend the film Boyhood, the Richard Linklater film, uh, which is actually a film about growing up and, and coming to understand things. Uh, filmed over I was a dozen or, or 15 years uh, that uh, uses the same actors over those dozen or 15 years. Uh, and then this is this is a bit of a downer, but we've already established through Eleanor that philosophers are buzzkills anyway, uh, is Manchester by the Sea, the Kenneth Lonergan film, uh, which will drag you through the emotional mud, but it has a set of deep characters, uh, each of whom always has more than you think they've got. Mm, well done, well done. All right, Susan Bigelow, why don't you go next? All right, so people have documentaries and, and films, and I just got some cartoons. Um, so... I want to endorse two cartoons. Um, one of them has been around for a long time. It's, it's Steven Universe. Uh, and it just came to its season, maybe series, I don't know, finale, uh, and which completes a lot of the sort of long arc, more emotional arcs of the, of, the, of the show. And it's something that appears like a kid's show, but there's a lot of deep stuff about relationships and friendship and war and all kinds of other things in it. It's really, really good. Um, the other one I wanted to to endorse is they've actually done a reboot of the 1980s cartoon She-Ra. And it's it's really good. It's surprisingly good. Uh it's also very 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 queer and its sensibilities and it's it's just wonderful to watch. So both of those things. I've often felt like we're kind of living in the middle of a golden age of American animation and the shows like this are why all right. So uh, before we go to Sam, I want to just – since you mentioned cartoons, uh, one of the, the – I had a cartoon memory while watching uh, The Good Place and that is from the cartoon version of The Tick, although I think this appears in at least one of the live action versions of The Tick too. So uh, because there's a, a moment in The Good Place where one of the characters has a full-blown existential crisis, grasps through the reality of death and impermanence for the first time ever. And I was reminded of a scene in The Tick where the moth explains to The Tick, everybody dies, Tick. And the tick goes, everybody, even horses. Uh, so, I love um, the tick. So it, it was great. All right, Sam Anderson, what have you got for us? Uh, well, now that, that season three of The Good Place is over, if you have a hole in your TV watching schedule, um, I cannot recommend highly enough a British TV series called Detectorists. Um, it is, I think it was on like BBC Four or something. Uh, it's three seasons long and it's a contender for my favorite television show of all time. It is about, it centers on these two characters in rural England who are metal detector enthusiasts. And so they're just kind of this, these, this great buddy story about these two guys who hang out looking for things in fields and find almost nothing ever. <laughs> um, and there's, there's almost like a touch of like a Samuel Beckett play about it or something, but it is created and written by and starring um, the actor Mackenzie Crook, who people might know best from if you watch the original British version of The Office. He played uh, the kind of string bean, bug-eyed weirdo named Gareth, uh, who's the sort of nemesis to the, the main character, and he was just an absolute weirdo. Well, it turns out he's a complete genius, and he's written this brilliant piece of television. So it's called Detectorists, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. All right. Uh, I'll do a one recommendation kind of connected to the, our themes today. Uh, I made a little joke before we went on the air to Todd about uh, Elaine Pagels. And in fact, Elaine Pagels, who's uh, one of the really interesting writers about religion, uh, has written a new book called Why Religion, in which she weaves her own story and these two massive tragedies in her own life into her own contemplation of religion. Uh, OK. And I should also say that it's, I believe, on the 21st of February, Elaine Pagels, who I've had kind of this academic crush on since about 1976 uh, is going to be on the show. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Also, I was trying to think of it, some piece of culture that I'd seen recently that wove in some of the themes from The Good Place. And what I came up with is I saw at the Roundabout Theater in New York recently uh, a reboot of Stephen Sondheim's uh, Merrily We Roll Along. And this is done by the Fiasco Theater, an amazingly inventive uh, troupe that kind of specializes in deconstructing old works, whether it's Shakespeare or Sondheim, and, and doing it in a new way. This is, in fact, a musical about how people lose their moral compass. This is, in fact, a musical about what happens to people when 
they – when all of the ideals they start out with become stripped away from them and, and some of their illusions are shattered. So uh, if – and, and this production – I mean the original production famously uh, was done at the peak of Sondheim and Hal Prince's popularity, uh, featured young actors like the completely unknown Jason Alexander, speaking of, Son, of, of Seinfeld, and closed after 16 performances. So this has been an attempt to kind of redo it. All right. I want to thank uh, everybody uh, who was on this show, especially in studio, Susan Bigelow and Rebecca Castellani, uh, Sam Anderson, staff writer for The New York Times. His piece about the good place in last year's culture issue was called The Ultimate Sitcom. Todd May, a philosophical advisor on The Good Place, uh, and his most recent book is A Fragile Life, Accepting Our universe, our, our Vulnerability. Uh, and, of course, we want to refer you once again to Mother Forkin Morals with Dr. Todd May, which you can watch as a digital video product. All right. We have to go. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll be back on Monday.